Okay, honors chem kids. We are now going to look at the other periodic property, properties that we can um, get from the periodic table as well. So we're starting a new chapter here. So chapter six, let me get this. Oh my gosh. We don't want this so large. Let's make this smaller. Okay. So in the late 1700s, we had a French scientist named Antoine Lavoisier. That name should be really familiar to you. He was the one that gave us the law of, do you remember? Conservation of mass. Remember, we could neither create nor destroy matter. Okay, so Antoine Lavoisier also, while he was at it, compiled a list of elements that were known at the time. So this was the list. Okay, these are the old English names. So gases, we had light, heat, deflogisticated air, phlogisticated gas, and inflammable air. Metals, we had antimony, silver, arsenic, bismuth, cobalt, copper. Some of those sound pretty similar. Nonmetals, sulfur, phosphorus, pure charcoal, radical muritanique, radical fluoricanique, okay, and then earths, we had chalk, we had magnesia, borate, clay, silicous earth, okay? So a lot of those don't sound like elements that we have today. You can see some of the elements, but you'll notice that a lot of the things that we have are way different. So about a hundred years later, we have an English chemist named John Newlands. He proposed an organizational scheme for the elements. He noticed that when elements were arranged by increasing atomic mass, now notice we are doing things by atomic mass. Their properties are repeated every eighth element. Now, those of you who are in music know that eighths are really important. So an eighth in music is called an octave, okay? So Newlands proposed the chemical, the property, the law of octaves after the musical octave, which notes repeat every eighth note. Now, when Newlands went into the um, Royal Academy of Science in London and proposed this, in 1864, how do you think he was received by the Royal Academy? He was not received very well. In fact, the Royal Academy really was basically telling him, you know, this is stupid. This is science and you're trying to bring music into this? Music is what silly parlor things happen and that's what women do. We're not going to do music here. That's not scientific. So he was basically laughed out of the Royal Academy of Sciences. Okay, and then in 1869, we have two major things happening. We have the German chemist Lothar Meyer and the Russian chemist Dmitry Mendeleev. Now, let me couch this in that Dmitry Mendeleev published first, okay? They each demonstrated a connection between atomic mass, right? We're looking at mass and properties of the elements. Mendeleev, however, is generally given more credit than Lothar Meyer because one, he published first, and like Newland several years earlier, Dmitry Mendeleev noticed that when the elements were ordered by increasing atomic mass, there was a periodic or a cyclical pattern in their properties. By arranging the elements in order of increasing atomic mass into columns with similar properties, Dmitry Mendeleev organized the elements into a periodic table. Now, the thing that's brilliant about Dmitry Mendeleev's peri periodic table is this, right here. Do you see those blank spaces there? He was essentially saying, you know what? We have not discovered all the elements. And if we actually look around, you, we will find that there are elements that will fit in here. And based on where they are in the periodic table, I can tell you their density. I can tell you their mass. I can tell you their melting point. I can tell you their boiling point, And I can tell you how they will react. So just on placement, Dmitry Mendeleev 
And those patterns was able to predict elements that we didn't even have discovered yet. Okay, by noting trends in the periodic and the periodic properties of known elements, he was able to predict the properties of yet to be discovered elements. Some of those yet to be discovered elements were scandium, gallium, and germanium. Actually, it doesn't have an either. Germanium, okay? After new elements were discovered and atomic masses were calculated more accurately, it was determined that a few of Mendele Mendeleev's elements were placed in the incorrect order. So in 1913, a chemist named Henry Moseley, British guy, discovered that atoms of each element contained a unique number of protons. So remember 1913, this is when we're playing with electrons, we're discovering protons, neutrons haven't even been discovered yet. So we are looking at protons now. And instead of using mass, we are going to use protons in the nucleus to order our things. So we rearranged Mendeleev's table, not to mass, but to protons, the atomic number. So when we look at things in terms of an increasing atomic number, the inaccuracies of Dmitry Mendeleev's tables are corrected. So let's define periodic law. So when elements are arranged in increasing atomic numbers, physical and chemical properties exhibit a periodic pattern. I would also say cyclical or repeating. Let's do an or repeating pattern. So you'll see the same types of densities coming up. You'll see the same types of boiling points coming up. You'll see the same reactivities coming up every so often. It's a cyclical pattern, just like the sun coming up and the sun going down every day is a cyclical pattern. Or the seasons of the year is a cyclical pattern. You'll see cyclical patterns in physical and chemical properties if we arrange the elements according to increasing atomic number. Okay, so we're going to look at this periodic table. We have done a lot of this before, but I want to go over this again. So we are going to put some things in here. Um, let's put the line in between metals and nonmetals really quick, and I'm going to make that a thick line. So if you remember, the line between metals and nonmetals starts right under boron, and then we just do a stair step. So everything to the left of this line is a metal. The exception here is hydrogen. And everything to the right of that line is a nonmetal. Okay. Um, what else do we want to put in here? We want to number the groups and the periods. So let's change my color really quick. So let's number the periods. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Now remember that lanthanum goes right in here and actinium goes right in here, okay? And then our groups, we have one, two, three, four, 
five, six, and so on. Okay, so we have seven periods and we have 18 groups. Okay, so remember the groups and the periods, what groups do the following elements belong to? So the alkali metals, let's highlight the alkali metals again. So let's just do them in pink. Okay, so the alkali metals, we put them in pink. They are, of course, group one. Okay, the alkaline earth metals, if you remember, these are group two. And let's find a color to put with these guys. Let's make them blue. Okay, so the alkali earth are blue. Halogens. Let's get a color for the halogens. If we remember halogens, these guys are group 17. So halogens, let's do yet another color for these guys. Let's do lavender. Halogens right here. All right, so let's put some lavender down by the halogens. Let's let that stay for a sec. And then we have our noble gases. So let's find a new color for the noble gases. Noble gases, let's see. That's group 18. So let's change this color to what haven't we used? We haven't used green. So let's use green for the noble gases. I see that my, oh, my lavender. Let's, let's redo this. I guess I moved this too quickly. So my halogens, let's re-put this in lavender. And my noble gases, let's put them in green. Now remember the noble gases are the very last column, group 18. And it looks like it didn't keep my tens place on my 18 either. I guess I move things too quickly. All right, so there we go so far. Noble gases are group 18. Transition metals, that is the D block. So let's get another color here. So the transition metals are the D block. So I'd call this Group, groups three through 12 are the transition metals. So new color here, let's do yellow. Okay, D block right here. There's the D block. And then let's put that also here. Oh, and I 
put the noble gases in green, so I guess I should put this here. And then the inner transition metals. Let's do the inner transition metals in orange. But before we do that, the inner transition metals are the F block. So they're the lanthanoids and the actinoids. Okay, so the inner transition metals, put those in orange. That's these guys right here. Okay, so those should all be relatively familiar to you. Let's put in, should we put in the metalloids as well? We'll put them in as well since we, okay, metalloids. Boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, antimony, and tellurium. Okay, those are the metalloids. Everything else is either a metal or a nonmetal. All right, let's do some more notes. So let's scroll down. The next thing that we're supposed to define is periodic property. Now, periodic property, these are properties that I can determine just like Mendeleev did with those blank spaces in his first periodic table. Properties that I can determine of an element just based on where it is in the periodic table. So property, whoa, I don't want that that big. Let's not have it that wide. Okay, properties, properties, plural. It could also be just a single property of an element. That can be predicted. based upon the element's position, I should say location or position within the periodic table. Okay. So just based on the location of an element on the periodic table, I should be able to predict a couple of things. I should be able to predict the atomic radius. I should be able to predict the number of valence electrons. I should be able to predict the melting point, the boiling point, some of the reactivities. Now, all of these I'm not expecting you to predict, but I would expect like a good chemist to be able to ferret a lot of those things out. So let's look at the alkali metals really quick. Notice we have the list of them, lithium all the way down to francium. They are in order like they are in the periodic table. Let's look at the melting points. Lithium, 180.5 Celsius, sodium, 97.8, potassium, 63.4, rubidium 39.3. What are you noticing about the melting points as we're going down the periodic table in the, the alkali metals? Are you noticing that every time we go down to the next period, the melting point gets lower? So could I predict about where we would expect francium's melting point to be? I think so. We would know it would be lower than cesium, and we would know it would be at least 10 degrees lower. So we would expect it to be about 18 degrees or even lower. Look, let's look at the boiling point. Lithium, 
1,342, sodium 883, potassium 759. Are we noticing also each time we go down a period that the melting point or the boiling point gets lower? Not by as much each time, right? So maybe, let's see, this last jump was 17. So maybe 10 degrees at this point would we maybe expect it to be boiling at 660 something, something around there. And radius, this PM, this is picometers. Super small. Let's look at the radius. 152, 186, 227, 248, 265. Notice every time we go down, that radius goes up. Okay, so we could predict that francium would have a radius greater than 265, probably in the 270s somewhere. Okay, so I can predict all kinds of things just based on the location of the periodic table. Okay, do you think we could predict and gather similar data for other groups on the periodic table? Do you think it would work the same way? Yes. This absolutely is how the periodic table came to be. We use these properties to predict and put things in groups. So let's look at the atomic radius. Now we have the electron cloud model going on. And so we really can't determine the edge of an atom. So what we do is we look at an atom bound to another atom of the same element. So say I had two oxygen atoms bound together, okay? So what I do is I look at the distance between the nuclei Oh, and I can't spell nuclei. So I look at the distance between the two nuclei, and I take that distance and I divide it by half. And that will be my radius. Because I cannot really look at the edge of an atom because we have an electric cloud. That edge is really fuzzy. So what I have to do is I have to determine the distance between the two nuclei when they are bound together and divide it in half. And that's the best estimate we have for atomic radius. So we look at half the distance between, oh my goodness, why did it do that? Between adjacent um, atoms that are bound together. Okay, so we look at half the distance between adjacent atoms nuclei that are bound together. And that gives us the atomic radius, okay? So let's look really quick at this graphic right here. Let's look at the atomic radius as we go across the periodic table. Notice here we do not have the transition metals. We are just going from the S block to the P block. So let's look here on the second period. We have lithium and its size, beryllium and its size, boron, carbon, nitrogen. What happens as we go from left to right on the periodic 
table with the atomic radius. Have you noticed that the radius gets smaller? Okay, that is probably a little bit counterintuitive because as we're going from left to right, we're putting in more protons and we're putting in more electrons. So more stuff usually means bigger, right? But here we actually get smaller, okay? So if we look at that, the reason that it gets smaller is we wanted to think of the atom like this. We've got a really tiny nucleus and we're putting the electrons way the heck out there. If I put more protons here in the nucleus, I have a more concentrated positive charge than I have the negative charge. The negative charge is really spread out. And because the positive charge is more concentrated, the more protons that I have there, the more I'm going to be able to suck those electrons in. So the more protons that I add, remember each time I'm adding another proton to that little nucleus, it's like having more and more magnets in that nucleus to pull those electrons in tighter, okay? Notice also as we go down the periodic table, what happens to radius? Now notice it gets larger. So think about it this way. Each time I go down the periodic table, I'm adding another shell, right? And what happens when I add, let's see, one, two, three, four shells. Let's see, one, two, three, four. This would be like Krypton. What happens to these electrons all the way on the outside of Krypton? Don't all these other electrons in the middle, in between these outer electrons and the nucleus, don't they shield these outer electrons from the pull of this nucleus? They do. So the more layers we get, the more shells we get, the more electron shielding we get. And because the more shielding we get, the farther we get away from that nucleus and the more electrons we have in between, the larger those atoms are going to end up being. Okay? So our overall trend on the periodic table for size is this. We get larger as we go down and we get larger as we go from right to left. So the overall trend is like this. Our smallest element is helium, and our largest element is cesium and francium, okay? All right. Let's look at the next thing. So this is trends in atomic radii. Notice I have the same trends here. As we get down to the bottom, we get larger. And as we go across, it says decreases. This is an increase. So the trend is still the same. This is going to be our smallest elements. And down here, this is going to be our largest elements. Okay. Wow. So I want to explain just a little bit more again in words why the atomic radius decreases across the period. I explained it a little bit, but I want to put it in words that are actually written. Okay. So Protons are concentrated 
in the nucleus and pull the electrons in because the electrons are spread out. So their charge to volume ratio is way, way smaller than the charge to volume ratio of the protons because the protons are all packed in that little nucleus. So because the protons are all packed in that little nucleus, they have a more charge to volume ratio so they can pull that electron, those electron layers in, okay? We also get electron shielding the more layers or shells, shells of electrons. So the outermost electrons are not attracted to the nucleus as much because they have electrons in the way. They have other, they have lower levels of electrons in the way. Okay, both of those, the amount of protons being concentrated in the nucleus and the electron shieldings are why we have the radius trends that we have. Okay, atomic radius increasing down a group is electron shells. Each time we go down a group, we add another layer. Okay, so these electron shells layer and shield the outer electrons Okay, which means that those outer electrons, the more layers that we have, get pushed out even further. Okay, so let's look at this. How can an atom become a positive ion, having a positive charge? Doesn't that mean that we have to have less electrons than protons? Okay, let's think about this. If I have sodium, I have 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and 3s1. I just have this one little electron on that third energy level, right? Sodium, one, two, three. I've got one little electron. If I get 